And here's the final video for this one then, folks. So this is questions 31 to 40 of T Time Zone 2, May 2017, paper 1. So uh, we're on still redox. So what are the relative volumes of gas given off at E and F during electrolysis of the two cells in series? Assume all electrodes are inert, so graphite electrodes or platinum. So what we've got here is copper sulfate solution. Here we've got uh, sulfuric acid. We've got the uh, positive, that would be the anode because it's electrolysis or panic works, positive is anode. And we've got the negative cathode uh, here. So what we've got there, we've got aqueous copper sulfate solutions. So we've got a choice between two negative ions, sulfate and of course hydroxide because there's water present. Hydroxide beats sulfate. So we're going to get the half equation for that, you have to remember it, is four hydroxides gives you two oxygens plus uh, two waters plus four electrons. So that's what's going on at this one. In this one, we've got the negative electrode. So uh, there's only H plus ions because it's H plus ions from the acid, H plus ions from the water. So it can only be H plus. So what you have there is two H plus gains two electrons to give you one molecule of hydrogen. Assuming the same flow of uh, current through it, we've got to balance up the electrons. We can't have four electrons in this one and two electrons in this one. If we've got the same current flowing through it, so this would have to be four electrons. So that would become four H plus plus four electrons gives us two hydrogens. So in terms of the ratio of gases produced, we get one O2 to two hydrogens at this one. So it's going to be answer B, where it's a one to two ratio. Then we're on to the organic section. So which functional group is per present in paracetamol? Uh, so we can see it's a phenol. We've got an OH group on a benzene ring. We've got an A mite here. Let's see what the options are, though, because the IB likes to use sort of weirdy functional names. Carboxyl. Now, carboxyl might be too bad, because you sort of think, well, carboxyl is a bit of a broad term for where we've got things of a C double bond O. But I'm thinking more that would be a carboxylic acid, maybe an ester. So possibly carboxyl. A minor group, definitely not. That's an amide, and a minor group would be a nitrogen not connected to a C double bond O, so just connected to a normal carbon, so not an amino, because an example of an amino group would be something like methylamine, where it's CH3NH2. Uh, nitrile, definitely not a nitrile, because you'd need a carbon-nitrogen triple bond for that. So again, an example of a nitrile, a simple one would be uh, ethane nitrile, as shown there. Uh, hydroxyl, well... I would, as a chemist, call this a phenol group, but, uh, sorry, a phenol, but again, you could say, well, this is a benzene ring or a phenol ring, and that's a hydroxyl group, because a hydroxyl group is what you find in alcohols. I'm probably favouring hydroxyl over carboxyl, because I'd prefer, be happier calling that a hydroxyl rather than a phenol, uh, rather than calling this a carboxyl rather than an amide, because, like I say, carboxyl, you're better off with carboxylic acid, maybe an ester, but then I'd probably just still call an ester an ester in terms of its functional group. So I'm going to go with hydroxyl over carboxyl because of the group there. That's my hydroxyl group. Which describes the reaction between a halogen and ethane, which is an alkane? Well, remember, that's our free radical substitution. So free radical, and then what type of bond fission do we get in the halogen? Well, remember, with free radicals, we have to have homolytic bond fission. So just to give you a bit more of an explanation, maybe we just did it very quickly, the three steps. So, of course, you've got your three steps. You've got the initiation, and that's basically where the halogen bond splits by homolytic fission. One electron goes that way, one electron goes that way. It gives you two chlorine radicals. Okay, so we can see where the free radical comes from. We can see where the homolytic comes from by the using the fish hook arrows to show the movement of the single electron. Just to quickly do the two propagation steps and uh, termination. Propagation then would be your ethane, C2H6, would react with a chlorine radical, which would steal a hydrogen off it. So that would then give you C2H5 radical plus HCl. The second step then, that C2H5 radical can react with more chlorine, which hasn't broken apart, and it can steal a chlorine off it, give you C2H5Cl plus another chlorine radical. Now we've got another chlorine radical that could then react with more ethane. So again, these propagation steps could keep on going and going and going until eventually we reach some termination steps where two radicals take each other out. Simplest one to remember is the opposite of the first reaction. So two chlorine radicals could recombine to give a molecule of chlorine. Alternatively, an ethyl radical could combine with a chlorine radical. So that'd be C2H5 chlorine radical gives us C2H5Cl. 
And then finally, the last possibility is, well, you could have this radical combined with the same one again. So you could have C2H5 radical, uh, two of them, gives you C4H10, a molecule of butane. Okay, so that's just a bit of a recap on that. Uh, which compound contains a secondary carbon atom? Well, again, if you're good at drawing out these skeletal structures, that will help you. So what's this first one? You've got a CH3, then the CH chlorine off that, then a CH, and then we've got two CH3 groups off this one. So that looks good to me. That's the secondary one because the carbon clarity and the chlorine is attached to two other carbons. So it looks like we've already got our winner. Let's check the others. What do they look like? Well, here we've got two methyl groups attached to this carbon and then another carbon and then the chlorine. Well, it's not that one because it's primary. This one's secondary. What about this one? Uh, well, that's where there's one, two, three methyl groups attached to this carbon and then the chlorine. Well, it's not that one because that's tertiary. There are three carbons attached to the carbon carrying the chlorine. And from this one, we can see again, well, that's primary. So it's got to be this one here, that secondary two carbons attached to the carbon carrying the chlorine. Which pair of isomers always show optical activity? Cis-trans enantiomers, conformational EZ. Well, it's your enantiomers, remember. Okay, that's where you've got like four different groups attached to a carbon. Uh, let's sort of keep it very simple like that. Uh, so let's say we had A, B, C, and D as our two different functional groups. That would be one enantiomer. And then you'd have its mirror image, which would be A, B, and then D and C that way. Okay, so that's your two enantiomers, and that's when you get optical activity where they rotate the plane of polarized light either to the left or to the right, depending on which enantiomer it is. Cis-trans, remember, that's your alkenes, uh, so is EZ, so that's your alkenes where you've got restricted rotation around a double bond. So cis and cis trans one tend to year when it's quite symmetrical. So for example, if you had something like this, this would be the cis one because the two methyl groups are on the same side, the two hydrogens are on the same side, and you get restricted rota uh, you get geometric isomers because it's restricted rotation around the double bond, and also because each carbon has got two different groups attached. Whereas the trans one would be this, where the methyl groups are on opposite sides. Conformational, I'd say that's more when you've got rings. So let's say you had a six-membered ring and then you've got two faces to it. Uh, well, you could either have the, let's say, two methyl groups on the same face, so they're both going down, uh, which would be cis, or you could have them on opposite faces. So one coming up, perhaps, and the other one going down, which would then would be kind of like trans. So that's what I'd imagine is conformational uh, isomers. Uh, and then the EZ, well, you tend to use that for more complicated ones then, so we won't get into that. I mean, basically, if you wanted to link these to E and Z, that would be Z, where they're on Z, Z, and Z, uh, and this would be E, okay? Which compounds can be, so B, which compounds can be reduced? Uh, well, there we've got C2H4, so that's ethene, uh, so that can be reduced. You can reduce it with hydrogen to form ethane, C2H6. This could be reduced, you could reduce it to an aldehyde, and then you could reduce it further to uh, an alcohol. And then, yeah, there's your aldehyde. That can be reduced to an alcohol. Uh, so either of these could be done with, this could be done with lithium aluminium hydride. The aldehyde could be done with something like sodium borohydride. So it's all three of them can be reduced. Okay, they can all have hydrogen added to them. In which order should the reagents be used to convert benzene into phenylamine? Uh, so what we'd have to do first of all, remember, is react our benzene with uh, concentrated nitric acid and sulfuric acid. And then those two between us give us access to this very reactive nitronium ion. So that will give us nitrobenzene. And then that nitrobenzene will need to be reduced with something like uh, tin and concave CL uh, to give us the amine. Uh, which will of course be protonated because it's in strong acid. So then the third it would be to treat it with sodium hydroxide, so we then get the free amine, okay, deprotonated. So, which one matches that? Nitration followed by reduction of the nitro group, followed by, uh, well, neutralization or whatever, just remove the HCl group, so uh, I'm going with C. 
What can be deduced from the following proton NMR spectrum? Well, we've just got one peak at around about two. Uh, there is only one hydrogen atom in the molecule. Well, we don't know that. We don't know what the integration trace is, particularly when there's nothing to compare it. This could be three methyl groups. This could be nine hydrogens. Uh, so, for example, what could cause this? Well, it's around about two and a bit. That could be something like propanone. Because propanone would uh, just give one peak because those hydrogens are in the same environment as those hydrogens, and that could be six protons tall. So it could be that. So that's wrong. Uh, there is only one hydrogen environment in the molecule. Well, yeah, the fact we're just getting one peak, that's what the number of peaks tells us, is how many hydrogen environments there are. Because of the symmetry, these three hydrogens are attached to a carbon, attached to a acetyl bond OCH3, as are these ones. So the symmetry means these hydrogens are all in the same environment, so it's that one. Molecules of hydrocarbon, not necessarily. This one's not. It's got an oxygen in it. And there is only one isotope in the element. No, you won't really sort of pick that up from NMR at all, really. Uh, so, yeah, that's a bit of a nonsense. So we're going to go with B. Number of peaks is the number of hydrogen environments. 39, what is the relationship between N and T in the ideal gas equation? PV equals NRT. All other variables remain in constant. Okay, so uh, what if we rearrange this to find N then? So N equals... PV divided by RT. So, uh, so as temperature increases, we can see that the N is going to decrease because temperature's on the bottom. So as temperature increases going along here, then N is going to get smaller. So we can eliminate A and we can eliminate C. So now we're down to a 50-50, which improves our odds dramatically, if you're a fan of who wants to be a millionaire. So, okay, what about these two? So these ones both show N decreasing as temperature increases, which is correct. Now, notice that N is proportional to 1 over T, and they're not plotting 1 over T here. Now, I'd expect this straight line graph if they plotted N against 1 over T. But this is not 1 over T, so I'm going against that one. So because they've now plotted the N against the reciprocal of 1 over T, which is then just T, I'm going more with uh, the kind of curve in here. So I think this is what they would have got if this had been 1 over T, because then, yeah, you'd see that clear trend as N increases, uh, sorry, as T increases, then N decreases in line with that. But because they've then plotted the reciprocal of 1 over t, uh, I would go with this one. Yeah, that's the best explanation I can offer on that, I'm afraid, but I got you down from the 50-50, and I say, I think that'll be 1 over t to explain this graph. And then which technique can be used to identify bond length and bond angle? you just got to know that, basically. It's x-ray crystallography. That's about all you do need to know about it. Remember, it can also tell you which enantima you have. Uh, when we had that sort of uh, question earlier on, I drew the two enantimas. You couldn't tell which one you had by plane polarimetry unless they'd already been identified. So to actually tell which enantima structure is which, first of all, you would have to use X-ray crystallography. Because the great thing about X-ray crystallography is it gives you a three-dimensional representation of the molecule. And that's why you can see the bond lengths, the bond angles, and also work out what chiral centers are present. Proton NMR spectroscopy, that tells you the number of what hydrogen environments there are. Infrared tells you what bonds are present, C double bond O, OH and so on. Mass spectroscopy tells you the molecular ion peak, and that, from that you can get the relative formula mass, and it will also give you the mass of any sort of common fragments. So it's not that one. So, and that's that paper done. Okay, bye folks.